I'm in a bit of a predicament. I joined a secret Santa, but I got paired with someone I've never met before. That won't stop me from going all out making the coolest gift package. But how can I make an amazing handmade gift for someone I've never met before? Let me walk you through that. Hopefully this will help you if you're in a similar situation. Along the way, I'll show you how to learn specific craft skills like making painted chocolates and resin earrings. But first, let's have our morning coffee. Welcome to Holy Cow Creates. Now, since this is October and I need to finish this for Christmas, you may think I have plenty of time, but trust me, it'll come down to the wire. Deadlines are the bane of my existence. If I wait for the perfect gift idea before I start to make anything, I will not finish on time. So before I even have a solid plan, I'm ordering some resin and collecting leaves to start preserving. If I had waited for a plan for what to do with these leaves before I started picking them, the leaves would have been all gone before I even thought of an idea. So my first tip is, start before you're ready. Sometimes you just need to grab the bull by the horns. Anyway, I've used dried leaves for a lot of projects in the past, so I know they'll be useful for... something. There is more than one way to preserve leaves. The classic route is putting them in a book with some paper towels to press them flat. However, I usually preserve them in silica sand, because silica sand preserves their three-dimensionality instead of pressing them flat. The main thing is to preserve them as soon after you collect them as possible, else they might shrivel up and turn brown before you get around to drying them. And yes, in case you're wondering, this did happen to me. In fact, I thought this project was ruined, because some of my favorite leaves that I thought were best for this project were shriveled and ruined before I could preserve them. Others broke because I wasn't careful enough while unburying them. So, I've started to prepare some things, yes, but I still haven't done the hardest part. Coming up with a gift idea for a complete stranger. Where do I even start with that? Well, my second tip is, do some research. Luckily, in this day and age of Instagram, Pinterest, and totally excusable online stalking, this step was pretty easy for me. But if your giftee doesn't have an online presence, another option is asking other people who know them. But you have to know what you're looking for. The first thing to look out for is, what is their aesthetic vibe? I have an automatic win because I just found her Pinterest. But if you can't find a Pinterest, often you can still pick this up just from observing their clothes, the color of their phone case, or water bottle, or how they decorate their room. Knowing their aesthetic vibe can help you tailor anything you make to their tastes. The second thing I look for during the research stage is what hobbies they have, especially hobbies that have a consumable resource. By this I mean something that they're always going to need more of, because this way you don't have to worry about if they already have it or not. For example, yarn for someone who knits or crochets, or shoes for runners. In my case, I found paintings that she made, and every painter will always need more paint. A bonus tip here for you is to use your connections. I know someone who works at Golden Artists and had them pick up paints with an employee discount for me. If you're finding this video helpful so far, consider giving it a like. But wait, isn't this video about making handmade gifts? Why am I buying paints even though I'm making my own gift here? Because tip number three is always have a plan B. This way, even if your do-it-yourself project goes south, you'll still have a great gift to give. Wow, Mr. Cow, aren't you being pretty pessimistic here, expecting to fail when you haven't even started yet? Be gone, Satan! Actually, having a backup plan is the number one secret to being a successful do-it-yourself creator. Anyone, even those who are outstanding in their field, makes mistakes. What makes all the difference in the world is being prepared for your mistakes. For an example, 
When ordering resin for this project, I was sure to order twice as much resin as I need and pick twice as many leaves as I thought I would need. This way I can fail several times and still have enough materials left to give it another try. I was glad I did because in the end, I decided to make earrings for the leaves, and a lot of the leaves I had picked were too big for this. But because I had so many options, there were still leaves left that I was happy to create earrings with. Now on to pouring resin, as time is running short. I won't go into too much depth about how to use resin here, but check the description after the video is over for more in-depth guides on how to make these projects if you want more technical details. But I'll give you this tip for free. Don't use the same hand that has resin on it to adjust the focal length of your camera. Getting resin all over the expensive camera you borrowed from your sister and have to pause mid-project to try to clean it off so the resin doesn't harden the camera lens in place and never tell your sister what happened. Anyhow, I'm just pouring an initial bottom layer and letting that cure so I can place leaves on top of that and they won't touch the bottom of the mold and be too close to the surface of my final cast. Once the resin has cured, we can place the leaves in and do another short pour, just enough to stick the leaves in place, and let it cure again before we do the final pour to cover everything completely. Why do we have to do the resin in this multi-step process? Because I learned the hard way that anything lighter than the resin will float to the top before the curing finishes and stick out of the top of your mold. But once you've tacked the leaves in place with some cured resin, we can do the final pour. While my resin is curing, let's dive into the next gift. We have one plan B, yes, but what about second plan B? Uh, I still wasn't sure she would actually like to wear this jewelry, and what if she doesn't like to paint anymore? I want to guarantee this will be an awesome gift. So my final advice, and this should work even if you know nothing about who you're getting a gift for, is get something that everyone likes, but make it yourself with a personalized twist. For an example, for another friend, I got Lord of the Rings themed coffee, because everyone likes coffee, but we can make this a more thoughtful gift by relating it to one of the other interests, like Lord of the Rings. In this case, I'm going with chocolate. Technically... Some weirdos out there don't like chocolate. Let me know in the comments if you're one of those weirdos. But in my case, the gifty has already let me know in the gift exchange description that she loves dark chocolate with nuts. We're going to make these chocolates special ourselves and personalize them. But as time is running out and I didn't have too much time to think about this, my gifty is an outdoorsy artist so I just searched nature mold on Etsy. I couldn't quite find what I was looking for, but I found these bird molds that looked pretty, so I bought them. I'm sure this choice won't come back to haunt me later. For a long time, I've been wanting to experiment with painted chocolates, so I'm ordering some edible food paints so we can paint these chocolate birdies. After a few days have passed and we're even closer to the deadline, finally the resin has finished curing, so back to that. If you don't use a proper silicone mold or spray your mold with mold release and instead use kitchen recycling like a Snapple bottle caps, uh, like I did, demolding them will apparently be quite a chore. But after quite some effort, I did demold them. I want to sand them down now, both for a more aesthetically pleasing shape and so it doesn't weigh as much as chaining a concrete block to your ear. Unfortunately, while I was sanding, the sanding pads kept flying off. A quick Google search indicates the problem does not exist, and therefore must be a figment of my imagination. <coughs> okay, enough of this bull. I'm using my Dremel rotary tool instead. Well, this works much better anyway. Once I sanded them down to a fairly pleasant shape, I switched to hand sanding them with some waterproof sandpaper to get them to a nice smooth finish. I didn't get footage of this part, but if you just close your eyes and picture being really, really bored for a couple of hours, you'll get the idea. I also had to drill a hole for the chain to attach to the earrings with. Um, 
Surely nothing can go wrong with this. Yeah, I, I I screwed up so many times here and had to redo it. And I had to sand down all of my mistakes and try again and almost ran out of room to even drill more holes. But eventually I did hide my mistakes and carefully drill a new hole that did the job. Of course, all this sanding took quite a bit of time. Oh yeah, I also sanded this thing. Uh, maybe she could use it as a paperweight. I'm too lazy to measure my resin, so I usually have some leftovers whenever I make resin projects. Since I've already mixed it up rather than letting it go to waste, I usually just pour it into some random mold with some random materials rather than let it go to waste. This is a product of one such occasion. I didn't make it for any special purpose and it came out really bubbly, so I never did anything with it. But I figured, hey, why not fix it up and throw it in too? This leads me to the final tip. When gifting, look around for anything you're ready to re-gift or abandoned projects you can finish up. Including these kind of stocking stuffers can help you declutter. It'll help pad your package and make it feel even more awesome to have a gift box full of so many different things. I also found this tea lying around my office. I don't really like tea, and the reason I had this tea in the first place was specifically so I could re-gift it at a time like this. Let me know in the comments if these 5 tips have inspired you to come up with any new gift ideas, but stick around until the end of the video because I have one more bonus tip. 9 days left, all that time went by fast. To finish up the earrings and the pendant, I have to sand things down more so the rings and chain can attach. Once everything fits nicely, I made this makeshift clothesline to hang them off of by some wires, and coated them with some fresh resin. This final coat gets into all the little scratches from sanding and makes the resin look clear again. Despite feeling like they were utterly ruined at several points, I think they turned out pretty great. What do you think? They look... fantastic. Great! Now it's time to finish the chocolates. What? Only a week left? I have to hurry! Tempering chocolate is a deep, mystifying science I still don't fully understand, and while I could research exactly what temperatures I need to bring the chocolate up to, and what temperatures to lower it down to, and how to monitor it perfectly with an imperfect candy thermometer. But all that is too frustrating for me, so I take a much simpler route. The much simpler way is this. Start with already tempered chocolate, like most chocolate is, and simply never let it become untempered by overheating it. And if you ever do make it become untempered, instead of retempering it with science, simply mix in more already tempered chocolate to fix the whole batch. Using this method, you want the chocolate chips to only barely melt. If they melt completely, take the batch off of the heat and stir in some more until they only just barely melt. After working with chocolate enough times, you'll start to be able to tell if chocolate is tempered or not just from the looks. But this is an easy way to test if you aren't sure. Dip some of the chocolate on a knife or spoon. If it hardens in 3-5 to five minutes, it's tempered. If it never hardens, or takes a long time to harden, it's not properly tempered. From there it's easy as pouring it into the mold, waiting for it to set, then demolding it, and then demold, and then demolding it. Okay. First of all, don't use a mold that's too thin or your chocolate will keep breaking when you try to demold it. If you do have a thin mold, don't try to incorporate nuts or anything else that will compromise the structural integrity. After I finally demolded some successfully after a couple of batches, the painting was as simple as mixing some pigment powder in with the painting material and brushing it on. At least I thought it would be what, what? What is this? What's happening? Ugh. I'm really happy with how this turned out. Okay, 
I try it again, and if I just don't use the color red, everything is fine. Here's what the chocolates looked like after they were painted. All right, it's coming down to the wire. I have to ship this today, or it'll be late. I've just about wrapped up this project, and I have a bonus tip for you. But first, if you liked the video and would like to see what I make next, consider subscribing. Back to the packaging. My free bonus tip for you is to package everything in a beautiful and aesthetic way. Everyone is different. For some people, gifts are all about what's inside the box. But for other people, the box and how it's wrapped makes just as much difference as what's inside the box. Making your presentation more aesthetic and appealing can make the gift receiving process even more enjoyable for them, even more so than what's inside the box. In my case, one of the fancy touches I wanted to include is a note that looked like it was written on old parchment. To start, I artificially weathered some cardstock with coffee and some dirt. For the final touch, I began to burn the edges with a lighter. What could possibly go wrong? Besides this note, some other steps I took were to paint this box to hide the old branding and printed out some custom design stickers to go with the chocolates. Now it's time to tuck everything in with some nice tissue paper and some fun ribbons. I decided to include all the chocolates I made that broke because they'll still taste good. Then the paint, the tea, the earrings, the pendant, the old resin paperweight, and very carefully, the delicately packaged chocolates. Also, since this was for a secret Santa gift exchange, I wanted to make sure they knew it was for this particular gift exchange, so I put this picture on the outside of the box. And that's a wrap! Yes, it's finished on time. Unless there's shipping delays. I think this is a pretty complete gift package that I think almost anyone would be happy to get. Hopefully, the advice I gave in this video will help you with your own projects. Always remember, if me, a clumsy cow, can do it, you certainly can do it too. If you like this, check out this other video.